What's up, everybody? How you doing? Mike Watson in the building for another exciting episode of Chat and Draw. And some of you may be just joining us right now, and you're like, well, who are you, man? I don't know who you are. You're always streaming across these networks. Well, let me tell you who I am. I am the publisher of Short Fuse Media Group, founder of Freestyle Comics, one half of the good, the bad, and the nerdy, the most enthusiastic person in comics, also going by the moniker known as the Super Mad Brother, Mike Watson, your host today and every day on these episodes of Chat and Draw. And Chat and Draw is a little show that's been concocted to put together to where I chat and draw, typically with an awesome creator about their character. Sometimes we do fan episodes, which we do have a Patreon-exclusive fan episode. And now that I'm talking about Patreon, let me get my shout-outs for my Patreon real quick. Shout-out to Andrew Duggan, Haley Dennis, Bradley Arney, Tom Kelly, and Unlikely Hero Studios for supporting me on Patreon, because I appreciate it. Uh, without you, I wouldn't have one. What up, J-Man? What up, man? How you doing? I think it's J-Man and Brad Arney. I think you guys are in the race for uh, most consistent views on the show, I think. Because you two are religious was watching the show, and I appreciate you both so much. Doomsmith in the building, man. How you doing, man? We got Doomsmith joining us on Twitch. And in case you didn't know, we're streaming live on the Short Fuse Media Group Facebook page, which I am the publisher, and YouTube. And Twitch, that's where all the kiddos hang out. So, <clears throat> today, awesome guest, guy, been trying to get on, we've had some misses, but we're finally here, so I'm so jazzed up, I'm so jazzed up that he's here. Let's just get right to this, man. Let's bring him in. Here comes a new challenger! John Jennings in the building. <laughs> How you doing? I'm doing fine, man. How are you? Oh man, I'm just like stunned by the graphics. I was like, "Ooh, I want to watch this show." <laughs> so wait a minute, I'm next. I'm like, I'm I'm the next challenger. You know, I didn't even know. I didn't even know it was like that. You know, it's really dope. I'm like, oh man, I've been missing out. You know, <laughs> <laughs> try to have a little bit of old school, uh, you know, oh, like '90s it. kid flair to it. <laughs> that was really dope. No, thanks for having me, man. And then, uh, you know, it's been a uh, it's been an interesting uh, shelter in place, right? I mean, so so this so this show spawned out of like the COVID epidemic. <laughs> yes, it did. Wow. Uh, right out of it. That is amazing, you know. Like, and it, it's a, it's just a, a testimony to to your creativity. Jeez, it's like I was super impressed. So anyway. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I'm like, I'm hoping that I'm not boring. You know what I'm saying? Oh, no, no, no. Well, thank you very much, sir. We appreciate it. Uh, oh, you yeah. coming on and taking the time. Shout out to Newton, who was actually on here yesterday. And uh, my sis, Moana, she's been on a few different times. Awesome. I saw All right. You <clears throat> so, Mr. John Jennings, you, you, you do a lot of stuff. Uh, I actually yeah. got the honor of being in one of your your huge books uh, through Line Forge, Black Comics Returns. So, thank you. Thank there you for you that. Right there, right there. <laughs> yes, yes, it's that one right there. <laughs> Bigger than my face. So, yeah. Why don't you uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about that and like uh, how that came about? Okay, okay. I was, it was, I was totally tricked into doing it. Actually, tricked. He said, "I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding." Well, actually, a little bit. So, so what happened was, um, the first book uh, was done by myself and Dave, Dr. Damian Duffy who is one of my best friends ever and a close collaborator. Uh, we've been working together on comics and particularly around race and comics or around um, representations in comics, uh, not only like just in who's doing them, but how they put out. You know, we, we started as curators and that kind of thing. And also we're both comic scholars. So, you know, we kind of took it upon ourselves when we figured out like, wait a minute, there's a lot of like black independent comics creators that are not being looked at, you know? And uh, one aspect of, of doing like your um, of doing of working in an academy is actually archiving and actually try to to kind of contextualize it contextualize like you know a particular uh, mode of mode of thought or like publishing or what have you and um, yeah so that's kind of how we fell into it because essentially like there was it was the original book was a response to the massive American comics uh, exhibition that came out in. Um, um, it was up, man. Hey, anyway, <laughs> they come out in, uh, it was 2000 and I think it was 2008, 2009, 2005, actually. That's right. And basically it was like filled with all these different creators of like 15 or so of some of the, some of the best comics creators in history. And there were no women in it, you know, so it was people like Jack Kirby, it was people like, you know, Charles Schultz, um, 
EC Seagar who created Popeye, but you don't you didn't really see a a, a diversity in, in like who was actually doing the comics. And then they were also talking about a type of comic, you know. So Damien and I took it upon ourselves in our outrage to start looking at like, well, who else is out there doing it, and then how are they putting these comics comics out? And uh, lo and behold, we decided we, we got a chance to do this show at um, the University of Illinois uh, called um, Out of Sequence, under, Underrepresented Comics in, in a, under, Underrepresented, uh, wait a minute, Out of Sequence, Underrepresented Comics in American, no, that's not right. I'm messing up the, I'm messing up the, 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 uh, the subtitle. It's about underrepresented comics, you know. <laughs> I'm like, I'm glad this is happening live, right? It's terrible. <laughs> it's um, <all> right. <laughs> underrepresented voices in America. It's been a long day, man. It's like I said, this is my third thing today. So, um, yeah, it's uh, so basically we're looking at like the different uh, folk who are making comics, how they were being produced, and uh, yeah, I can't believe I forgot the subtitle. But anyway, so what happens is. Um, we were, we were really excited about the show that we're gonna do at um, University of Illinois. And I remember in the elevator almost, we were like, oh my God, we, we did it, we got this show. And then we realized, wait, we have never curated a show before. <laughs> so we wanted to do like a practice show, right? And we were like, okay, we're gonna do a smaller version of this. We're gonna do it at Jackson State. And you know, uh, we wanted to focus on black, art black artists, right? right. And, um, yeah, so we started putting together uh, uh, you know a list of folk that we, that we knew from from the Black Age of Comics and you know people that we that we uh, have become friends with and wanted to talk about their work in a, in a public space. And I figured like you know people need to know about these creators, right? Because really it's about promoting the culture, right? Right. And um, I mean essentially, I mean when you're working for the for a university, you you're literally like a you know, you're kind of working for the state, you know. So um, and this was an opportunity to really try to get a lot of these people. Um, you know, some some shine and also, you know, talk about the culture. So we ended up after, let's see, I think it was, I think it took us about a year and a half and we did that show, it was very successful, but it ended up being a bigger show. And then I started, I started looking at this, this publisher out of um, New York called Mark Batty Publisher. And I really liked their, their books. And so I started contacting, um, you know, one of the editors there and we managed to get a deal to pull together the first book, right? And it was the first book of its kind. It was the first book of its kind. I think it was a very uh, a novel idea. And we put together like, I think 50 or so of some, you know, some of the, um, I think some of the most influential comic artists working in, in independent comics who just happen to be people of color, black folk in particular. And I think it, you know, it was pretty successful for them. They eventually, but they went out of business, unfortunately. And uh, yeah, and so the book fell into, it fell out of print, right? Right. And then fast forward, I don't know, maybe, I don't know how many years, I guess a couple, you know, a few years. I was actually working, you know, I was doing some stuff uh, in, San, in, in uh, San Francisco. I went into Mission Comics and <clears throat> there was a gentleman there who was working at, uh, named uh, David Dasnyake. And I didn't realize at the time that he was working as a, as a promotional person for, um, you know, for, for our publisher, right? <laughs> And um, yeah, and so he he basically was like, you know, here's uh, you know, he talked to his boss, and he was like, you know, it's Mike Kennedy, and and he was like, yeah, so this is an opportunity to either like bring this book back into print or to do a brand new one, right? And right. I thought that we at first were going to do a, uh, you know, a um, a, 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 like a reimagining of the old one, but you know, there was some there were some things with like. Um, with copyright issues and stuff like that. So Mike said, you know what, let's do a new one, you know? So like I said, I was tricked into doing a new one. That's a long story, but that's how, kind of how it, what happened. And then, so we wanted to do an update. We wanted to actually kind of add on to, you know, the people that were in it before, but then other people that, that we've met along the way, like yourself, that we thought were doing dope work and needed to, you know, have that space. And uh, yeah, and that's kind of like how Black Comics Returns happened. And, um, you know, people seem to really dig it. And I think uh, it's a, we were able to, to produce a really beautiful coffee table book. The cover is done by the amazing Ashley Amanda Woods, you know? Um, I know, she's a beast. Yeah, yeah so talented, man, so, <laughs> so talented. Just one of the most most awesome people out there, you know? And yeah, and and uh, Mike, you know, he was like, yeah, so he's he's the uh, the publisher for Magnetic Press, um, which now is, a, you know, a uh, is affiliated with um, Lion Forge, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so some some of the juice behind the book is actually you know a black owned company, which was really cool, right? Right, awesome. And, uh, yeah, yeah. So that's um that's that's kind of like how we got there with that particular book. But 
it really is kind of an outcropping of a lot of the interest that Damien and I have always had about like just who's doing comics, um, how they're being produced, who's studying them, uh, how do we actually kind of like talk about diversity in comics, you know, more openly, that kind of thing. So it's, mm -hmm. yeah, just kind of like an outcropping of my research, you know, so. So all, all this from being tricked into making Yeah, comics. you know, I got tricked into doing it, man. You know, the first one was on purpose, but this one's more like, hey, you know what, let's do this new book. And we're like, all right. It's really kind of wild because it's kind of like chasing cats that are on fire that could teleport. So it's like, you know, it's uh, a... <laughs> Curating anything is a lot of work, actually. So it's like, you know, it's it's a labor of love, but you know, and people always like, well, is it gonna be another one? It was like, we didn't know that this was this one was gonna happen, actually. So we don't know. Never say never, though, I guess, right? Right, 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 right. I mean, yeah. the first one was uh super successful. Like a lot of it got around to a lot of people, it was on social media. Mm -hmm. Um, I saw like I saw a copy of it going for like uh two hundred dollars on Amazon or something like that. Oh um, yeah, yeah. I've seen it for, for for like you know maybe five times as much you know because you know what happened was the publisher went out of business so it's like the book is out, the book is out of print so those particular people that are selling those books mm -hmm. they're either like independent you know people who own it who bought it and are trying to sell on eBay and stuff like that or they're retailers who've been kind of hoarding the books and sitting on them you know that kind of thing so yeah I mean they're 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 definitely like. Um, very bad, you know, they're valuable now. And it's like, so if you have one, hold on to it, you know? So, right. All right. Well, I was always a little curious about how that actually got started for you. And, um, you know, it's kind of like a tidal wave of things now. <clears throat> yeah. Very, very happy to be in book two. And a couple of my brothers are in there as well. Yeah. 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 No, it's definitely, uh, we want to do like a really, um, like a swath of representation of like the independent black, you know, creators that are in, you know, they're in there, you know. And as I recall, I think, you know, I think we met like at what, C2E2, right? Yes. Recall? Yes, yeah. we did. Yeah. And, you know, because I remember like picking up the hot, one of the hot shot trades then, you know, and I was like, yo, this is really good, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And uh, yeah. And that's kind of like how, you know, how we ended up meeting and, and, and making connection because people are like, well, how do you, you know, how do you choose people? I was like, well, honestly, we just start with folk that we know, you know, I mean, we yeah. just, you know, that's, you, we didn't have like a lot of bandwidth as far as like let's do let's let's go and scour the nation you know it was just we we're part of the part of the community and um you know and and then we knew that there was a lot of quality people you know out there working who i think um needed to be seen i mean you know it's funny because when we talk about like the comics first of all like the comics industry is not is more there's more than just one industry first of all it's right not and then you come with the idea of uh mainstream comics, which is always ludicrous to me because, you know, being a famous comic book artist is like being a famous, famous dentist, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I think the last famous illustrator was probably what, Norman Rockwell maybe, somewhere like that? Or, you know, or, or I guess you could look at some animators, you know, like, like say like um, the guy that did, uh, uh, like who who's, who do you think is like the most famous, like, you know, like cartoonist right now, you know? Yeah, everybody I <sighs> I could not give you a name versus a studio. I, I just okay. started to get to, uh, I actually just learned that uh, I knew different people worked in animation, like when it came to like an episode of a show or whatnot. Yeah. But I just recently, I can't pronounce his name, so I'm not even going to try to do it. Mm -hmm. But this one artist, they co consistently seek out for mm -hmm. all the big anime fight scenes, like for My Hero Academia, for Naruto. Right. Just because that this person's flavor with the animation is so dope, so whenever they have a big fight scene, uh -huh. he's the person that animates it. But that's an animation, though, right? Yeah. All right. So yeah. So he's a dentist. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> like my mama don't know who that is. You know. Right. All right. And my mama know who, who Norman Rockwell was. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. It's like you know we get really caught up in these like you know in these really interesting conversations about fame and about credit and about these types of things and. You know, at the end of the day, it's like we're just, you know, we're nerds and we and we're into this the thing that we're into, and then we forget that everybody else maybe maybe isn't, you know, because I don't know that gentleman you're talking about, you know. Um, and then the uh yeah, so that's interesting to me when like, people talk about mainstream comics. Actually, like, you know, the idea of the mainstream, you know, Flintstones is mainstream, but you know, Green Lantern, maybe now I guess it is. You know, you know what I'm saying? You, you see what I'm saying? It's like there's levels of fame and levels of access, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, in our, you know, if you look at like the black independent comics, you know, uh, community, there's people who are like legendary, you know, and but again, you know, that that idea of like fame and 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 um, 
and, and, and also like, you know, credit and, and all these different things is something that me and Damien really like, a, we were really uh, into, you know, and so we're like, okay, we, how can we change this, you know? And so the next step, of course, was to try to create um, spaces um, like the great Yumi Odom and uh, Turtle on Lee, you know, these spaces where, um, where we can go and, and exchange ideas, right? So that's where like my work in like creating like black conventions or, or, or um, kind of comes out of. To me, it's like the next step, you know? So you, first of all, you start doing the publishing stuff. I mean, as far as like just kind of identifying like who these people are and then starting to try to create spaces where people can come together, fellowship and empower themselves culturally, but also economically, right? Right. Because right, at the end of the day, it really is a lot about access to different, you know, different types of, of power structures, you know? And you know this as an independent publisher, right? Yeah. I like your, I like, I like this drawing you're doing. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Trying to get them yeah, in right here. So food, let, let's switch gears a little bit here yeah. and uh, let's talk about this character. Who am I drawing? What is this about? Um, so Frank Johnson, man. So, you know, so Half Dead Frank Johnson is, uh, is a character I created myself. Um, I'm from Mississippi originally, you know, okay. and uh, I grew up uh, in the sticks in the country. And so I, and I grew up listening to my, you know, my grandmother talk about like paints and you know, spooks and supernatural things, you know. And then my, and my mom was a huge action movie fan. And like, she loved like, you know, horror stories and like, you know, I, let's just see, I didn't really have a lot of filters on what I was watching. I was <laughs> so right. you know, I got it, honestly, I got, you know, I got like both of those aspects, you know, in me for us, like this kind of, you know, traditional cultural references, you know, kind of straight out the, the South. And then, but also, you know, I grew up listening to the blues and things like that, like that right? And then over a period of time, I realized like, man, I'm really interested in horror and like how horror as a, as a space can be very useful to talk about uh, race and, and oppress, you know, oppression and stuff like that. So me and my friend uh, Stanford Carpenter kind of postulated this idea of what we call it ethnogothic, you know? So the idea is like looking at these gothic spaces and um, using, using hard to unpack and, and kind of like through catharsis kind of talk about these issues around race. So that's kind of like where the kind of underpinning of this character comes from, but he's a, he's a fictitious cousin of, um, of uh, uh, Robert Johnson, the, the, the legendary blues man. So as you know, if you know your blues history or blues folklore, you know, supposedly Robert Johnson goes down to the crossroads and he sells his soul to the quote unquote devil. And then he's able to play the guitar, you know, like nobody's business, right? Right. And so this gentleman is his first cousin, Frank. You know, Frank is a is a sharecropper. He's not very good at it. He's actually better at gambling, right? What ends up happening is he gets into like a gambling thing with his, you know, with with the landowner that he's, you know, that he's sharecropping with. And he's really a good card player. So he ends up winning a lot of money, like a lot of money from these white landowners. And then he realizes what kind of mistake he's made. And he tries to get home and get his, you know, get his family together because he, he realizes that, you know, he's embarrassed the, the guy who's, you know, this, you know, the, the, whose land he's living on. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, he doesn't get out in time and his, his family is uh, captured and, and they're, they're uh, tortured and they're lynched, actually. Mm. And so what happens is <clears throat> um, his wife and two and two kids and and him as well. But what happens is when he's hung, the rope breaks. and He actually is able to get away. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is, you know, he's cousins with, with, with Robert Johnson. So, you know, he's in a safe house, kind of like kind of contemplate wants to do. And he's known a little bit about hoodoo and conjure work, you know, just from like being in that space and uh, gets really drunk on some moonshine, goes down to the crossroads and makes a pact. And he becomes a very powerful conjure man pretty much overnight, exacts his revenge, and then realizes that he's made like a really horrible mistake. So then what he does is he's actually, he actually uh, is able to talk to the devil for me. <laughs> he's like, He's like, you know, I made a mistake. And I tell you what, I have these other souls. I tell you what, if I can get, you know, if I can actually figure out something where I can get my soul back, you know, I, I'll give you these powers back and, uh, you know, you can take these souls, right? And so he beats the devil at craps because the devil only throws sixes, right? Uh -huh. And um, yeah, and the devil's like, you know what? Nah, man, I'm not going to break this pack, man. You're, so, you're slicker than, some, than a lot of my demons that I work with. So I tell you what, I'm going to give you half your soul back and then you can work off the rest. And what he does is he's a, also a soul collector. He's like a, um, what do you call a psychopomp? So, so when someone passes away, 
uh, and especially if they're going, you know, if they're going to hell and uh, he collects their soul. But the thing is, though, is that he's trying to um, compose a song. It turns out that souls have particular tonalities to them. Uh -huh. and, you know, if you know your Bible, you know, the, the devil's going to get tossed into a, a, a lake of fire and brimstone at the end of time anyway. So, he, you know, he's trying to compose a song to keep them company. And so basically the souls that he's collecting are like a blues song that he's collecting. So he has this mystical piece of paper and it transposes the souls onto, into this song. It's called the Low Down Devil Blues. So that's kind of like the, under, the underpinning of the story. But essentially he's kind of like a, a fusion between like, say like a John Constantine and maybe like an Easy Rollins, you know? Okay, it's all right. In the 1930s uh, Chicago. And uh, yeah, but that's some of the, yeah, so there's one, there's one uh, graf uh, graphic novella out with Rivera Publishing. I have lots of plans for him, obviously, because he's very long lived. So he lives into the future, you know. Eventually, he it, so eventually he becomes a it becomes a cyberpunk story, you know. A cyberpunk so, story. Yeah, because he lives to be super old, so he lives into this into a sci-fi space, you know. Okay. Yeah, I have this I have this, I, I have this idea of what I call conjure punk. So it's like you know looking at cyberpunk, but also like um, you know. What do you call it? A hoodoo culture and stuff, and because hoodoo is a type of technology, right? It's 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 different. It's a, just a different type of science. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, so it's like you know, hoodoo technology mixed with like cyber technology kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, so that's that's a little bit of the background. What's interesting about the hand, and I got the name Blue Hand Mojo from um, the Gullah people, you know, um, from the from the Channel Islands, you know, off the coast of like you know uh, South Carolina, you know, who are like. Uh, brought over because they could, uh, you know, slaves because they could work in indigo, you know, mm -hmm. and some of the older slaves would have their hands would be dyed blue because of it because of touching indigo so much, right? Okay, and I think it'd be kind of a cool um, kind of thing to actually have this character have this this hand that the more he uses it, you know, the power start the the, the, the blue starts to creep up his arm, you know, because when he makes this deal with Scratch, he literally reaches into like this place called the Noir. Which is like okay. a representation of um, it's like a representation of all black creativity, right? Look, and, I, I gotta uh, pause you for a second. You, yeah, I I didn't got lost in your story. I'm just up here, John, and just listen to all of it. And <laughs> we got yeah. comments in the section. Uh, oh, yeah. Three sorry. dot. No, no, you're you're good, man. This is exactly what you're doing. We chatting and John. Uh, okay. Three dot. Yes, this book is available. I'm getting the link up right now. Um, <laughs> so I can put it in the comments for you guys. Uh, looks like JM was participating in uh, naming some um, artists that he was really digging. Okay. Daniel Calvin, what's up, man? How you doing? Uh, oh, what's up, Dave? Hey, trying to put y'all's names, y'all, y'all, y'all's online names with y'all real names is it's confusing me. I'm old and I and I work with kids, so I don't remember my own kids' names. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> JVS says, I've been to so many cons for 25 years, and the last 10 years, the artist alley has gotten more diverse, which is awesome. But there is more black African American comic book creators. But I do remember in high school in the early 90s, comic book readers were very underground on the down low, and black and African American comic book reader fans very mm -hmm. much on the down low to the point you didn't even know you didn't know it was an X file. Mm -hmm. Let me see here. <laughs> he says, I know, I know, I know. All right, I am, should be right. <clears throat> All right, there it is right there. The link where you can get this book has just been posted in the comments. Mm -hmm. So go ahead and click on that. I believe yeah. that's the Amazon link he gave me. It is, yeah. Yeah, that's one yeah. of the best places to get it. Yeah. All right, so let's close that out. All right, cool beans. He's yeah. All right, so Three Dot's going to go get him a copy. I heard that. So yeah, I'm hoping to um to, to to go back to him very soon. I mean, you know, it's it gets really busy. As you know, like Damien and I've been doing like a lot of um adaptation work fairly recently, like the Octavia Butler books that we just did and um, you know, the Alfonso Jones book that we did with Stacey Robinson, you know. Mm -hmm. for, um, I, I just saw the piece you did for Greg and uh Greg. Uh for Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that yeah. thing was hot, man. Thanks, bro. I appreciate it. Yeah, I was gonna say, man, because you just do this in black and white, right? Yeah. You should send it to me. Send this to me so I can color it. Oh, you're getting the piece after the show. Oh, cool. And I'll, you know, I'll, and I'll send you back a colored piece. You know, that's so what's up. That's what I do. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think you know this is actually one of the only times that someone is drawing this character too, because usually I'm drawing them. You know, so um, that's really cool to see like someone else's interpretation. It's great. Yeah, anyway, um, I, yeah. I really dig the story. Um, yeah. And yeah. I've kind of 
I, I've grown to enjoy more of these stories. And I think <clears throat> it's different because we don't have a lot of people outside of the indie world that is writing about the black experience mm -hmm. and finding very creative ways to put that in mainstream um, in stories. Yeah. Um, dude, yeah. I, 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 everybody that watches this show knows I am a huge punk. I do not like scary movies. I, I do mm -hmm. not like scary anything. But uh, my wife and I have faithfully been watching Lovecraft. Uh, oh, yeah. And I've been watching from the safety of my blankets. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh. but the the way that they slide real life aspects into their story, mm -hmm. like Emmett Till was on an episode. Yeah, yeah, the third, yeah, Holy Ghost. Yeah, yeah, that was crazy. And when he asked, "Am I going to enjoy my trip next weekend?" and it said, "No, no, no, you're not, young man, at all, no, at all, exactly." Uh -huh. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that that was really chill. I guess got chills thinking about it. Yeah, so this is the kind of stuff I've been looking at for a while, man, because um, you know, we've done we we've, we've used like the supernatural to talk about these issues for like a very long time, you know? And, um, you know, so what I've been doing, I actually teach a class on race and horror here at the university. And okay. uh, yeah, it's called um, Afrofuturism and the visual cultures of horror. And so the whole thing is based around this notion, like what I said, the ethnogothic. I've been thinking about this stuff for a long time, way before, um, you know, before like the rise of Jordan Peele even, or, you know, because when I first saw like Get Out, that's what really made me think like, okay, I'm not crazy. Other people are thinking like this, right? <laughs> and so now you have a thing where it's almost like we've con we've con we've con created a whole nother way of thinking about horror and I think about, it's become like a genre, you know, it's become mainstream. And so so that means it's it's a viable space and that's really empowering, you know? So when you see like stuff like black speculative culture, like really taking off like this, because of course, you know, um, you have like before Black Panther and post Black Panther, right? And now you have mm -hmm. like before Get Out, post Black, post Get Out, you know? And and everybody is, uh, you know, we have all these great stories that we've been kind of just, uh, and we're drawing from our different cultural experiences. And uh, I think the sky's the limit. So yes, I mean, but I've been, you know, I've been thinking of postulating about this in the, you know, as a, as a scholar for many years. And so it was just really, um, you know, they made my job a lot easier. I was like, you know, I actually, you know, tweeted to them the other day, like, thank y'all for making my job easy. Cause you know, cause I'm definitely gonna be teaching Lovecraft Country, you know, we teach Get Out, you know, but also there's a lot of comics out there too. Like I don't know if you've seen Abbott by, you know, written by Salina Mad, you know, mm -hmm. um, there's some really cool stuff out there. And uh, dealing with various aspects of, as you say, the, the black experience, the African diaspora, you know? Yeah, you know, so yeah, so that's, that's kind of like the gist of the story. I want to try to get back to them soon, uh, but I've been doing like a lot of editorial work these days too, and also, you know, I'm a new dad. Like I've been, I have a, you know, a toddler now, so he's, uh, him and his mom are, you know, you know, uh, visiting family right now. But it's been, you know, it's it's, it's daunting that we've been sheltered in place, you know, <laughs> right? But, you know, I've been teaching from, you know, from the same computer I'm on right now, you know, and I will be for look probably another quarter or two actually. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's uh, it's been a while. <laughs> so, also congratulations on on, on the kid. That's oh, great. Thanks. Yeah, Jackson's pretty amazing. He's uh quite the blessing. He's also a bundle of energy. So, <laughs> so yeah. Oh, it's, it's looks like Brad Arnie's gonna check out the book as well. He's a huge, huge, huge comic book fan, man. Brad Brad uh bought me a book today and mailed it to me because he wanted me to check out something. Oh, that's he, funny. <laughs> he, he, he was like, We're both gonna check this out. Yeah, so we're both on together. the ledge. That's funny. Well, it's a different, you know, it's a black and white book. You know, it's um it's really like a non-traditional format, you know, and it's, it's very much in inspired by like film noir, you know? And uh, yeah, so it's like a really over, it's a really strong like monologue, you know, behind the piece. And, um, you know, from a first, from a first person perspective, it's definitely cartoony, but it also is very much leaning into the kind of EC comics, like Warren illustrated vibe, you know, from back in the, you know, seventies and eighties, you know? Oh and yeah, cool. absolutely. I think, uh, I don't think, uh, and I know I've used that description myself anymore, but I don't even think that qualifies for cartoons anymore that it looks cartoony because there's so many stories now that have been coming out that are just so adult yeah, mixed with the cartoony style. Like it doesn't even matter. It's just like, yeah, no, you know, I, I, good. yeah, it was just my way of like, just kind of, it's not real. It's not a realistic interpretation. It's more abstract, you know, mm -hmm. but, uh, but sometimes I think when you're drawing gory, horrible stuff, it's actually that it becomes, you know, it, I think it speaks more to the metaphor. You know, I'm not trying to, to gross people out. I'm actually trying to sh use horror in a symbolic fashion, you know? So 
Okay. Yeah, there's tons of culture. And I have like a bunch of stories that I want to tell with Frank, actually. So, you know, I've been thinking a lot about, um, you know, kind of moving into more of an illustrated prose space because this book actually starts to play around with text a lot in a different way. And as you know, comics are very difficult to make. So They are. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Three Dot just said you only got four in left in stock and he just bought one. Now there are three. Tell people they better move. They want it. I heard that. I'm feeling sure, <laughs> sure my publisher is very happy about that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Doomsmith says he's got a question that delves into ancient history for you. So I'm waiting for that question to ancient pop history. up. Uh, the story, and J Man says the story that you're telling right now with this character is definitely TV show or movie worthy. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate Doom, that. Doomsmith's asking when you were at Milestone, which books were you on? No, I wasn't at Milestone. That was an easy question. <laughs> you know, I'm like, yeah, I was never, I never worked for Milestone. Yeah, what, what happened when Milestone was was publishing, uh, publishing books? I was in grad school actually, and lo and behold, like I, um, I think around the time, around the time at, at the end of Milestone's initial publishing uh, era, I was actually getting ready to send in some pages. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> mm. and I was like, what? They're not making books anymore. And I actually met, I think I met Dennis Cowan and. Um, and uh, Michael Davis a little bit after that. I was actually teaching at um, Jackson State because I went back to Mississippi to teach because I, I went to school at the University of Illinois. Okay. Was there for like, you know, about four years, got a couple of masters and then went back to a uh, couple of masters, nothing big, just, you know, one, two, knocked them out real quick. Nope. They, you know, like, bam, bam. You know, anyway. <laughs> yeah, but it was, it was, it was, it worked out really well for me. I taught at Jackson State for a while. So I was actually still interested in comics, but I really didn't start making comics and like professionally until much later. I always wanted to, but you know, I think at the time I was still of the opinion that if you're not drawing like Mark Bagley or like, you know, John Basima or somebody that you're not going to get a gig, you know? And I really didn't know a lot about independent comics. And so I was like, so I kind of put it down for a while, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I, and I, I would advise people to not do that because I got so out of practice. And then when I got, I really didn't start, you know, doing a lot of comic book illustration like professionally until like much later, actually, actually way after Milestone stopped publishing the first time around. So, yep, never worked on a book. That's funny that people thought that. That's interesting. Okay. All right, JM says I'm currently reading Damien and John's adaptation of Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sour or Sower. 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 Mm -hmm. Sower thank you. Mm -hmm. Can John talk about his approach to color? Ah, that's a good question. All right. So, you know, color, you know, and we talk about this a lot. Like, so a lot of times when you think about comics and color, so in some ways, color is like the soundtrack to the comic, you know? Oh, uh, yes, sir. Yeah. You know, and so it's like, um, we were thinking a lot about, you know, what the, what the future, if we keep, if we keep looking at, if we keep doing the kind of stuff that we're doing to the planet right now, right? Where um, you know we're destroying the atmosphere and you know global, global warming and these things, that there's different types of like you know uh, elements get released into the sky, and they said that basically by the time the book is supposed to be set, that we might actually have like more reddish tint to the sky, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. And so we're like, okay, so I used a lot of reds as an overlay in those in those pieces, but you know, like I said, I live in Southern California now, so I literally live in the area where that story takes place, <laughs> which is crazy. There is actually a character from Riverside, California in the second book that we're doing. So that's kind of like in the original book. So we, what I would do is actually take pictures of like the mountainsides and stuff and actually of the surrounding, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, color schemes. And I would use those as palettes for the, uh, you know, for the, for the book. And that's kind of like where I got the color schemes from, you know? So, you, so that's where you see like a lot of browns and reds uh, of course, you know, there's a there's a scene with the, you know, the, I don't want to give it away, but there's, let's just say things get really hot and won't be to the point. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's kind of scary because that book is so pressing. It's almost like she knew what was jumping off of like now, you know, mm -hmm. one of the most terrifying things about it is that there's a character who's the president who's kind of like if you took Trump and Pence and fused them together, which is terrifying. And then, um, oh, that don't President Jarrett, yeah, and so he actually uses the phrase "Make America Great Again" in the story, you know. Wow. Yeah, yeah, but again, again, you know, so did Reagan. So she's really writing about Reagan, you know. But uh, yeah, it's an interesting book. But thank you for that question, though. Like, you know, I'm, I'm glad people pay attention to the color, you know. That's what's up. Uh, Brad said he's excited to check the book out. He ordered one himself. Thank you, Brad, for doing that and giving support. For real, thank you. 
Newton says black and white books are the best. Uh, you know, I think I want to do more of those. Oh, then is that? Yeah, of course, you would think so, right? <laughs> right. You yeah, got I know. Any, dope. For real, for real. Yeah. You got any advice for Newton? Uh, he he eventually does want to color the book. He was on the show yesterday. We talked about it. But his he's saying it's it, the thing that keeps him back is uh, he cannot find a palette that satisfies him. Uh. Because you know, he's really happy with the way Crescent City Monsters look black and it's white. It's a gorgeous book. I, I don't it know. I mean, that's an interesting question. You know, um, I would I would definitely, like, try to draw from, like, you know, the cult, the cultural surroundings and stuff like that, things that actually feel narratively right for it. Um, I definitely think it would probably be, like, a really controlled, like, limited palette, you know, when you're coloring stuff that has that kind of uh, tone, like, that kind of... Um, it's very modeled, as I, you know, the art is very like, you know, it's, it's, it's stylized a particular way, but there's a lot of shading. It would probably be an easy book to color because of that, actually, you know. Mm -hmm. And I would say like, you know, don't go heavy handed and, uh, and you know, think about like the storytelling beats. Of course, you got the local color, you know, stuff that's happening, like for instance, you know, night scenes and stuff like that. But, you know, also think about, because it's, there's a, a really heavy supernatural element, you know, to Crescent City monsters. Um, you know, you could you can take advantage of that and actually do some really wild stuff with color, you know, that way, because, you know, again, it's the soundtrack of the book. So, you know, even even if I because I, eventually I would love to do, you know, blue and mojo in color, actually. But, you know, I do like the black and white, but it's just like, you know, I want to, I want that blue hand, man. You know, <laughs> it's like when you got color in the title, <laughs> you know, you might want to do some color, you know. But it would still be really controlled. I would say definitely not, not nothing that looks like something that would come out of Marvel or DC. You know, it already doesn't. But it's just like I would say we'd be really like re, re, a lot of restraint, so to speak. So, mm -hmm. all right. Advice, please. <laughs> Jamin says, uh, John, if this was a TV show or movie, what famous actor would you have in mind to play your character? Oh, that's a great question. You know, um, back in the oh, that's a good question. You know. I had I had Isaiah Washington in my head like when he was younger for a long time, you know. Okay. But I'm not really sure if that's the if, I, if that's who I would choose now. You know, are you coloring, man? Well, I'm adding this. I, I always add one bit of color when the characters have power, and then all the reference you saw sent yeah. me. You yeah. gave me this when I oh, sent okay. it to you. I sent it to you as a PNG. Okay. Okay. I'm cool. All right. I'm just flipping. Out. Oh, is he coloring it anyway? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, but now that's a good question, man. Um, I'll have to sit with that one because I don't know a lot of the newer actors. That's one thing, you know. And that dude that plays that played Black Manta and Candyman, he's in everything, so he can't be in it, you know. Yeah, he's getting mighty popular. He's getting, he's getting a lot of a lot of a lot of uh, you know, he's the chosen one right now. Um and uh and, you know, I honestly would want to maybe even go with an older character, an older character actor, but I'm not really sure who that would be right now. You know, not 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 you know, probably like Maybe late thirties, early forties, you know, but I'm not, I'm not really sure who that would be. That's a good question. I need to think, you know, I need to think about um, I need to think about like shows that I've seen, you know, because uh, oh, what's the name of this show? It's called Falling Waters. The lead actor there, I think, could be kind of cool, you know, even though he's English, I think. But I liked his, I liked his. Uh, he reminded me of Frank a little bit. Um, hmm. Oh, that's a good question. That's, I'm stumped. <laughs> I feel like I'm failing him. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no, you're good. That, you, that's what we're here for. for that black actors. Hold up. Let me see. I'm going to do a search. I'm at the, I'm, 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 I'm like doing like, who are the top black actors right now? How long, have, how long have you uh, been working on this title? You know, um, it didn't take me a long time to do it. I have to admit, it was uh, at first I was doing something else, and I got inspired by um, uh, Jim Valentino to do something that was a little bit more marketable. I was actually trying to get this other piece published, and he was like, "I love this, but it's it was a, it was a story called uh, Pitch, and it was about this black man who basically he was almost like the Ghost Whisperer, and he could like paint, you know, the you know the the, the spirits of like you know." Uh, dead slaves and he would like release them once he painted them kind of thing mm -hmm. so, oh, this concept this concept i can't publish this <laughs> so i think it's different now actually that was a while ago that was like years ago i remember a decade ago um so i don't know maybe like uh i don't know i guess it's been it's been a while shoot man maybe over five years ago but you know i'm i'm not um i have a lot of stories for the character that i've just been sitting on because i've been busy with other stuff you know 
and uh, but at least uh, maybe like at least seven years, I think. You know, as far as like just um, having ideas about them, I, I have a ton of stories I want to get into, and that's why I was thinking, like, you know what, I might have to write. I might have to, you know, do some prose and illustrated prose for him. You know, because he does. I think he would fit because he's a, uh, um, you know, it's kind of a private investigator style of the character. You know. Yeah. You know. But I definitely wanted to break off another thing, you know. And the fact that he's still long lived, you know, it, that opens up a lot of uh, storytelling potential, you know. He's fan cast. He said, "What about Michael Coulter?" Michael Coulter. I said, "Michael Coulter." I don't want to. Um, I don't want to pigeonhole anybody, but. And I'm sure he might have the opportunity. I'm sure he has a he may have the ability to do it. I just I just can't see him being gritty. And like when the artwork that you've sent me for this character and how you're explaining, like I imagine this character to be a real gritty character. Oh, you're talking about yeah. You know what? The, oh, you're talking about he used to play um uh, Luke Cage. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, I have not seen Evil, but I heard he was really good in Evil. Um, I didn't particularly. I mean, I, I I liked him enough as Luke Cage, but I think because of the writing of that show, I think he was probably like the least interesting character on the show, you know. And that's, that's sometimes like uh, that happens with like superhero narratives, right? Mm -hmm. The other thing too, it kind of speaks to how undeveloped his solo story was in the comics to some degree, right? I mean, right. Yeah. So to me, he becomes more interesting when he gets married, honestly, you know, as a, as a character. But um, and that's not Michael Coulter's fault at all. That's Marvel's Marvel's fault to a certain degree. Um, no, yeah, I thought he brought a lot of. Um, I thought he brought a lot of st style to the character. Or not, he he's definitely likable in the role. Yeah, he is. But, yeah, yeah, he definitely. Yeah. But I've seen. But you know, he played kind of a villain character, a heavy in uh, Black and Blue, the movie with Nomi Harris. Yeah. Okay. So I think it could get a little raw. You know what I'm saying? That's different. But this character definitely is is um is 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 uh you know who might be great actually now I think about it is Blair Underwood. Mm, all right. Yeah, because he's you know he's again his older actor definitely has a lot of range. He can play really really heavy characters. I don't know if you've ever seen like um, what's the movie where he's the heavy? He plays the villain actually. It's a, it's set in Florida, and it's with Sean Connery, and he oh. uh, he's a serial killer I think. And yeah, I forget that. I don't he's know that one. Yeah, it's a yeah. What's the name of the dog going? Hold on, it's gonna drive me crazy. <laughs> yeah, Underwood. Connery. Just Cause. That's the name of it. Came out in 1995. Yeah, because he because he actually has a, a sense of gravitas to him, I think, you know, um, for the character. Because the character is really kind of got there's a lot of there's a lot of heaviness in him, you know. And uh he's not the way I write him, he's not really a likable character. You know, that's what I'm saying. I was mm -hmm. borrowing from people like uh um yes. John is the, yeah, yeah, Night Boy. Yes, we're actually getting ready to pitch that to a larger publisher. Um, it's been in development for a while just because of our other things. Yeah, what happened was, you know, Stacy got a job as a professor and, you know, I moved and, you know, Damien's been doing his thing. And we did the Kindred book, you know, and yeah, but it's actually next up to try to find a, a publisher for it. Yeah. And then, you know, Damien is the writer on that. And uh, I think it's a really dope book. Yeah, but yes. We're we're actually getting ready to gear that gear up to try to find a a, a bigger publisher for that book because I think it has a wider a wider reach, you know. So, what's your thoughts on or or how do you think things are going to progress? Um, I know we've been talking a lot about the black narrative and and things or whatnot, but do you think that Hollywood's still going to bottleneck and control what comes out, even though there have been multiple things that have gotten more attention and made tons of money you think they're still going to try to pigeonhole what exactly comes out you know that that's a good question you know I, it's hard for me to say you know what i'm saying because we've been in spaces like this before where like oh you know these black movies are making so much money you know that kind of thing like the black exploitation era what have you mm -hmm. um, i think that honestly you know that they because of the because of what's going on with COVID right now and 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 in a, in a post COVID space, I see that you know animation is definitely going to be probably going to blow up a lot more, right? Because you can be safe and make it. You know that's one thing. Um, I think they're going to have to be really really careful about how they make things. Um, now that we've shown that not only do black people want to see them on ourselves on screen, but other people do too, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, honestly, I, I think that if if 
if this has like normalized itself and become mainstream, which I think it has, then I can't see them not making more stuff, you know, more things. Because at the end of the day, it's not about like what's getting represented. It's about money, you know. If it's gonna make money, then it's gonna it's going to be made, you know. Unless there's some other agenda happening, I guess. Well, I guess sometimes that's the case. But you know, the other thing too is that now with like these different streaming services and these different uh, ventures that are happening, you have to have content, you know. And now that you know that people are able to access these con this content through so many different devices. Um, I cannot see them not trying to take advantage of that, you know. Yeah, because it's just a it's a capitalist instinct. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, Avengers the game is an example of that because in reality it is an Avengers game, but mm -hmm. Kamala Khan is the star. She's the lead in it. I've heard about this game. You know, I'm not a gamer, but I love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I've heard about it. You know, like oh really? And yeah, did did talk about how uh, amazing she is in that in the game. You know, because it's. To me, of course, it's just another mode of storytelling, right? So yeah, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, like that's yeah, that's good, and that's a great character too, by the way. I like come on. No, it absolutely is. Uh, it's it's the so with Spider Man, it came out for PS4, and now this Avengers. Um, the thing that I really have liked about both of them is that they they are what I've called the they still are in the MCU format of storytelling for, for the movies. They still they kind of they fit. Mm -hmm. with, with the quips, the dialogue, and how they're narrating and things like that, right. and Kamala Khan being a lead character in the game, she's an Avenger. The other Avengers yep. are in there, but yep. the story's being told through her eyes. And I, I'm like, that's, you know, I know people think that she's just a a, a gender swapped <laughs> diversity care, um, but she is a really good character. And for her to yeah, be, no, I, who thinks that? You know, <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> Well, first of all, she's not gender swap, right? Because you know, Ms. Marvel. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's fun. She got that be... mixed up. No, it's cool. It's cool because I was, you know, because I I was a big fan of. I liked Ms. Marvel, and you know, I was a big Captain Marvel fan actually back in the day too, like Marvel, you know, that cat. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. used to get those, and I collected her book back in the day because of him, you know. So it, so Marvel got me, you know. what I'm saying, <laughs> but uh, and I and I followed Carol Danvers. I actually like Carol Danvers as a character, and I've been looking at her incarnations over the years, you know. But to me, like that whole thing about like, um, you know, representation and stuff. I mean, yeah, it you you definitely want to see newer characters and and see like uh, characters that are original characters, and and that's totally that should be the way to do it. But honestly, like you know. And this is something I talked to Stanford Carpenter about quite a bit. And he was like, yeah, you know how expensive it is to create a new character and then market a new character? You know? I, it's, I hope y'all are listening. I hope y'all are listening. I say that on my channel it's all ton, the time. It's like, like, I've, I, like, for instance, I mean, I've had this character here for like a long time. You know what I'm saying? I haven't had a chance. It's just, you know, some is time and money, right? So, yeah. you know, if you think about like the expenses from a, from a, from a, uh, just a marketing standpoint, because at the end of the day, it really is about profit, you know? So do you spend the money to trademark and develop a new character or do you take a character that already has some cachet that may or may not have, you know, a, um, a following at the moment. And then you think about, well, how can I actually franchise this character? And it's something that's happened in comics since the beginning of time, you know, since the beginning of like superheroes. Right. So like to me, Kamala Khan is just another legacy character. That's it. You know, Man, um, have you have have you been secretly watching my show? Because th these are I, these are all my argument of points. Well, you know, I, not yet. And I, and I feel you know, I, I, you know I, I need to, man. Let me put me on the spot like that, okay? You know, no. I, <laughs> anyway, no, but um, no, but seriously, like, because I used to have this issue. Because I used to, I have to, I used to be pissed off about. They just hand me down heroes, you know. Yeah. I, you know, honestly, one of my one of my least favorite black characters is Steel. Because of that, because they'd be pissed off. I was like, "Wait a minute! So you gonna take like John Henry, Iron Man, Superman, and Thor, and just and just put it together?" Hate that character. You know, that's how I was. I mean, he's cool, I guess, but he's still like, you know, he's derived from the, all these different characters, and so you know, he felt like the, but the, the yeah. same attention and love that's given to Miles Morales is given to Kamala Khan. That was given yeah, exactly. To, um, to, to it's, Mighty it's, Thor. It's a new day. Him. It's a new day. You know, what I'm saying because basically what happened is like, well. They've been doing like legacy characters forever, right? It just so happens that they're not just white men, and I think that's the that's the that's the that's the kicker, right? Uh, where it's like, you know, it, to me, it's like getting mad at, at, at businesses for trying to make money is silly. <laughs> <laughs> that's just silly, I, I, right? 
It's like, how dare you try to make money, business? I'm like, I'm like a corporation is actually legally bound to make money. That's what they're supposed to do, right? So if they're gonna see like, all right, well, the bottom line is this, do we make a new character called Amalgam Man, right? Or do you say, you know what? Let me let me take this character that you know a lot of people aren't really following. It has, a, and and do something interesting with it, and speak, and also at the same time speak to a bigger audience. Because at the end of the day, you know you want to grow your audience, you know. And guess right. what? They're more than you know straight white men reading comics. Believe it or not. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So you know, so at the end of the day, like you know, Barry Allen, I think probably was the first official like legacy character, right? So when 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 Barry Allen takes over the mantle of the Flash. I guess it was 1950s. Is that right? Am I making that up? When oh, I, I when, don't when know. Did start? I think it's 1950s, right? Or is it I'm going to I'm roll with you on this one. Yeah, because, yeah, the Flash from Two Worlds, you know, where, where he's running, yeah. with, with, their, with Jay Garrett's Flash with the with the little doughboy helmet. Side by side. Yeah, side by side running. Yeah, yeah. And that's when the character gets in, you know, that's when you, you see, like, oh, wait a minute, this is a legacy character. And that's become part of, you know, actually, it's a trope. You know, and I think what it, what happens, though, is that People get bent out of shape when they're not white dudes. You know what I'm saying? Mm. <laughs> I was like, okay, well, that's um, that's unfortunate, but there's other people, you know. It's not like it's diminishing the character; it's expanding the character. You know, and we've been doing that for right. a long time. But I, I, have, I, just, I have very I just, little issues with that. You know, so very. I just think issues. it's awesome. These are these are all the exact same talking points that I have that I've been using. Um, I've I've even used mosaic in uh, part of my discussion. Like, oh, you everybody about the mosaic, huh? The character mosaic. Yes, the character mosaic. Oh, I love that character. He's a, he's a perfect example of what everybody asks for. He was created by two very popular creatives, talented. super talented triple yep. A team, yep. both men of color. Yep. It is featuring a man of color. Yep. It is uh, a brand new character. Word. He was put with all the mainstream characters, and it's well done. Yeah, put together all that stuff. <laughs> you know? uh, he was in the big summer blockbuster. He was the key to the to winning in the summer blockbuster that they did with him. And right. his book sold thirty eight thousand copies as a number one issue. And the mm -hmm. number one selling book was Big Trouble in Little China, the sequel, which sold over five hundred thousand copies. Right. And this is a property so, that was created in 1970, 19, what, 1980s, Right. Right. So yeah, I mean that's a really good argument. Like very well done. Yeah, because like yeah, because I love that character. Honestly, I think it's probably one of the most interesting characters of color created in the last fifteen years. Honestly, you know, so I, I love that character. But and I teach the I teach the book in my courses actually because you know just have to think about how interesting that character is when it talks about race, man. Oh my mm -hmm. god. But you're absolutely right. I mean, um, legacy characters make more sense in you know in in the pocket, you know. Um, Think about it. I'm like, so when, what was the most the most recent successful character that is a blockbuster character, superhero, right? Mm -hmm. like, uh, would it be? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Who would it be? The like, most recent character right character. now is like the most successful popular character, but but the but the latest one, the, the, like the last one to be created. You know, maybe Deadpool, maybe, maybe I don't know. Who is it? I have no idea. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I'm not trying. Uh, I don't know. I think you, I thought you were asking specifically of a, a character of color because no, 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 no. I'm just talking right about superheroes in general. In like, general, yeah. Like, what's the last dope super, like, great superhero that people, everybody's like, oh my god, I can't wait to see that character. You know, is it? Is it? Is it? Honestly, maybe? it's Miles Morales. Okay, yeah, but see, yeah, and the thing is, got, and, Miles, and Miles Morales, is, and Miles Morales is a, is a legacy character. That's what I'm saying, like yeah. original character, like he's original, original character, yeah. I'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> is it probably is it like um because Hellboy is kind of a he's to me and he was created in the nineties right eighties late eighties he was I mean, he's kind of anti I don't really think of him as a superhero but that's just me being a professor and nitpicking about genre. Uh, yeah. Steve Stone says kick ass, <sighs> kick ass, static from uh Cameron Christopher. Okay, that's nice. Um, okay, Doom kick ass it is, is kick ass on. popular again. I mean, Doom Smith, it's playing fine. I'm watching it on YouTube right now and my Twitch channel. It's playing um good right now for us. I don't see any lag or anything. So kick ass. Interesting. Kick oh, John Wick. There you go. Okay, so is John Wick a superhero? The, the, uh, the way he fights in the movies. <laughs> but here's the thing though. So there's a, you know, not to be a stickler about it, but you know, 
he's he's a he's I guess it depends on how you look at it. But in the, mm -hmm. you know, in the academy, you have different things that kind of like say if a super if a superhero is superhero or not because he's closer to like say a James Bond character or like a, yeah, mm -hmm. or even like a I could see him being a pulp character or something like that. He's right. not human, you know. what I'm saying like John Wick is a is a is a hero he's, that is super, <laughs> you know, super right, right. Bigger, than, bigger than life. But as far as like the tropes, when you think about, it, he has a costume, he has an alternative, you know, he has a mission, you know, just altruistic. Mm. Super is altruistic, you know. He's not. He's always he's always about he's about revenge and he's about his dog and about his car. You know, what I'm saying he's his motivations are not altruistic. So he's to me, he's not a superhero. That's good. That's good, though. You know, I'm just saying. Like, what was in the comic books? All right, in the comic books, Wolverine. I don't know. When was Wolverine? You know, like who's the popular? Who's the most popular original superhero? Was it uh, the dude that Jonathan? Hickman? I'm gonna have to say, uh, like original. Lately, you, I probably original, have to go with course, like, He's not like it's not a legacy character. It's um, it's from the comics and super popular. Everybody buys it. You know, was it, was it, huh? Deadpool. Oh, Deadpool, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. Deadpool. All right, I cool. think for um for a little bit. No, she wasn't on that level. That? Um, I was gonna say like when I was when I was going to the comic shops regularly, um, a couple years ago, a lot of people were talking about Squirrel Girl and how much they love that Squirrel Girl book. I'm the creator of Squirrel Girl. That's funny. Yeah, that's an old character too, though. That's interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. Squirrel creator. But like, she got popular, popular because of uh because the writing got better, obviously, also, but. Look at her redesign. She yeah, looks exactly. like a regular girl. Right. You know, chubby, yeah. big teeth, but out here still trying to be a superhero, hanging out with the other ones. Right. So my whole thing is, like, I guess, when you see my point, though, I'm, I'm basically maybe making your point, too, is that, you know, hot shot. There's the great. <laughs> the latest and great. Yeah, exactly. Right? No, and so... um Maybe maybe Robert Kirkman's character, you know? Oh, uh, Invincible. Invincible, maybe. Um, but then again, like my mama don't know who Invincible is, you know. I was, I, I was with mama so, here you go. Right, any um any popular character from Walking Dead? Michelle. They're not superheroes. Oh, they're not said, superheroes. They're not superheroes. You know what I'm saying? I said superheroes. Those are heroes that never mind. Okay. But you see what I'm saying. No, no, I see what you're legacy. saying. I see what you're saying. We're talking about legacy characters and mm. why they get created, you know what I'm saying? And that's why. Because Creating brand new superheroes is not is not profitable. It's not, you know, not not to the bigger not to the big audiences. You're not gonna make a lot of money. All the stuff that we're seeing making money now was created in the '60s and '70s and stuff. Yeah, right? absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Like the like the Infinity Gauntlet. I'm like, okay, that's old. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, Steve Stone says the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Which they are on a hell of a run right now. The, the okay, new turtle books, okay. they're on a super good run. Okay. Um, J-Man says, I would say the Joker, learning um, learning of a solo movie. I was so curious how they are gonna do how they were gonna do a Joker movie with no Batman or Bat Family and try to separate itself from any Joker we have known, and it worked. Joker's not a superhero. And so and, and also he was created in I guess my whole point is like he was created like a long time ago too, right? Like yeah. I'm, okay, what I'm saying is like the Ninja Turtles are like, when was Ninja Turtles created? Late 80s. That's right. And they're and actually they're parodies of, of Daredevil, right? They are. They are. They're parodies of the ninjas from Daredevil. So like, yeah, late 80s. So I'm saying it's like there's no like really, really new characters that are like super popular right now that are superheroes, that are original superheroes, you know, at least not in mainstream. Like what, Captain Underpants? Because <laughs> if, you, if you're talking about, so if you... So your whole stipulation is within comic books, a brand new character that's not a legacy character right. that's popular and hot right now. And literally, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, you can't think of one. The only I, thing I, I, I'm, I, 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 and I'm like, I'm really, I'm, stra I'm straining to is what I'm saying. You know, yeah. uh, you know, I guess what I'm saying is like these characters that like have become super popular now in the multiplexes, you know, the, the Guardians of the Galaxy were created in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? And so, it's, and so when people say like, oh, create new characters, it's like, yeah, it's like burn money. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know? Um, and, these, and these studios, they can't, they're not going to do that. Like, not not especially because Marvel Marvel Comics and DC Comics, they're not comic book companies anymore. Right. They're, they're P farms. Mm -hmm. let's, let's get it. Let's get it right. They're, they've, they've actually changed. They've, they've become something else, you know? So, the closest like, thing, to, yeah. The closest thing to your definition is outside of comic books. And it's it's my hero academia. They're all right. superheroes, but they're a manga. Yeah. 
they're yeah. all original. Yep. They're, yeah, they're exactly. the they yeah, that's right. Yeah. Because even I heard of that. You know, somebody made me watch it. I'm not really a fan, but you know, mm -hmm. that's cool. I'm not really a big anime dude, though. You know, right, right, right. I'm old. You know, what I'm saying I'm like, you know, Mobius. I want to see. Can we animate a Mobius comic book? Let's do that. <laughs> All right, that would impress me. <laughs> like, uh, but, um, Steve says Spawn. Yep, I was thinking Spawn. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so, so, so Spawn is like, and it's, so I was thinking it had to be in the '90s because Deadpool is like. So let's say, how old is that? That's like what over. Hold up. I got 30, the 30 years. Thirty Spawn. years. Right. You <laughs> said right. So it's like Yeah. So yeah. he's the newest thing because he fell off for a while. And honestly, I only think he got popular again because Todd McFarlane mm -hmm. is a promotional. Is a, big, is a really successful Kickstarter, right? Yeah. And, so uh, and they were coming up on that three hundred issues. Right. So, so the thing is, is too, like, is like when we talk about popularity, we are really kind of talking about popularity with a nerd, like so people who read superhero comics and stuff, right? Too. That's the other thing, right? Oh. So it's like, yeah, Spawn is super popular, and, and I could see like, yeah, flesh out other giant power use very good. Yeah, that's cool too. Yep, I'll lie. Oh, I love your book, by the way, sir. It's a good book, The Maroon. <clears throat> that's a good book. Venom um, legacy, yeah. Venom the legacy character. Yeah. So the thing is, is like, yeah. In order to 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 like to fuel those types of uh, transmedia things, you you need a lot of freaking money because <laughs> you know there's a lot of uh, when those characters were created, there was hardly any competition. Like Superman, everybody's reading Superman. Superman, Superman, right. Superman, Batman. Everybody's reading that stuff. And now we actually, it was before television was invented, for God's sake. It was before rock and roll existed. Mm-hmm. Let's just really think about that. You know, <laughs> people would still go to see menstrual shows for fun. You know, right. so, so it was like this is when those created those characters, like Superman is. We're still making Superman movies, right? So it's like, yeah, you're gonna. It's 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 more expeditious to create Ironheart than it is to create like a new superhero. You know, I want to. Uh, I want to I want to shout out All Eye Comics. Uh, I think this is the first time you've uh, tuned into the show, man. So thanks for joining us. Um, Doomsif said, "What do you think of Crescent City Monsters?" What do I think about it? Yeah, man, that's one of the coolest comics out there right now. You know, <laughs> it's got all the things. It's got all because I'm from the south to start with. You know, so I was born like about an hour north of New Orleans to start with. Mm. Uh, I'm really into horror adventure stories anyway you know it's got all the things it, it hit all my cockles mm -hmm. i think it's beautifully done you know it's well written it's well produced it, it, it can go toe to toe with a lot of the different like quote unquote mainstream things out there it's one of the best things out there and i love that book yo steve steve said get it right even superman was stolen from john carter of mars i don't know he's stolen i mean no i mean no it's more like uh no it's still superman was stolen from moses <laughs> 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 All right. but like uh, it was, a, he was more he was more influenced by this uh, this short story from a pulp magazine called um, was it Guardian? No, that's not right. I forgot the name. I forgot the name of the story that it was actually inspired by. But it was like, but yeah, but you know, the, the thing about the superheroes is that they're they're remixes of things. I mean, he's right. Yeah. Like, you know, they're they're um, you know, you have characters that are proto superheroes like the Phantom and Doc Savage and stuff. So Superman yeah. took all those elements from different. From different types of pulp beginnings, mix it with, with an immigrant's narrative, you know, because it's really about immigration. That's what it's about, yeah. um, and created a new a new genre, you know, the super. So, so yeah, you're right. John Carter definitely is an adventure character for sure, you know. Yeah, but not a superhero, right? Because he's he's in his pulp tradition, more like sword and sorcerer character, adventure character. Doesn't have the, the characteristics that we when we see superhero, we know it, you know. The crest on the chest, the whole thing. It's like you know, it's a it's a it's a genre trope, you know. Yeah. But well, for instance, uh, you ever seen uh, you ever seen this book? You ever seen this movie called Push? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's probably one of the best X Men movies. It's not an X Men movie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's you know, or like or like uh, another great movie that has super characters in it that aren't really superheroes. It's Chronicle. You know, it's mm -hmm. characters with superhuman powers. It's very different than someone who's a superhero. You know, who has like an identity. Has a particular mission, it has a particular power set and a particular visual pre presentation, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so that's you know I think one that you'll enjoy is uh 
I I was very surprised by it. My wife picked it. Um, Unknown Origins on Netflix. Uh, it's a oh, foreign yeah. flick about superheroes. I heard uh, about this. You did this is the one. Is it a serial killer movie? Yes, yes. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I want to watch that. That's in my queue. <laughs> I, yeah. Yes, it is. Uh, it's the real first good. Sounds great, actually. It was surprisingly good. Yeah. Thank you. Sometimes they sometimes they mess around and make something good, you know. But like like for instance, uh, uh power. Uh, what was that one with with uh, with, well, what's his name? Uh, Jamie Fox. Um, power. Po- um, Project Power. Project no, Power. Right. So characters that are super, right? <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. who, who could become superheroes, but he would have to go and create a, you know, create go, you know, get a layer and create a, you know, a costume. You know, because yeah. you know, it's superheroes a particular kick ass. Actually, I think was a good answer, by the way. You know, because because he's actually kind of a parody of superheroes to a certain degree, but also is a good superhero character because it's like vigilante. Case. Essentially, he's kind of like a Batman or the poor Batman or poor Daredevil. You know. Three Dot wants to know, kind of off topic ish. Uh, what do you guys great. think of League, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen? Not the movie. You know, yeah, I, I think I think League of Extraordinary Gentlemen was really good. It's funny because Alan Moore is an interesting dude because he basically has made a career doing legacy characters <laughs> <laughs> or being inspired by um, Hancock. Okay, didn't start in the comics, but yeah, but people, yeah, I mean that's I think Hancock was a brand new character. I'm thinking about I'm thinking about like the comic book for, for, for mm-hmm. Hancock was interesting was an interesting movie, you know, because he did become a superhero at the end, right? Because he had the costume, he had the whole thing, had the origin story together. That's mm-hmm. good. That's good. Yeah. Uh, eventually, you know, I know. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're terrible. Yeah, we started Kid Code. It's a 40-page joint. It's like, I would love to get back to Kid Code. I think at this particular point, what happened was we were doing a lot of independent stuff and we messed around and, 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 uh, and got bigger contracts and stuff that you know did have like heavier deadlines so that's but eventually yeah you know we wanted to do more we want to do like at least two more chapters and put out a, a trade actually so mm. yeah uh, like they're people, saying, are, people are reading books i like that people are reading our books <laughs> what, <laughs> uh what about the matrix jabbar says yeah so science fiction adventure story yeah definitely people yeah i don't yeah i don't think that that's a, to me neil's not a superhero is a hero that's super, mm. you know yeah because because it really does have like there really are like tropes, you know, when you look at like the creation of the superhero, you know, it, it, there are like things that, that actually kind of like make it that thing. Right. You know? Yeah. Like for instance, like, you know, it's kind of like saying, um, and sometimes they dip their toes in every, in different things. It definitely was like a, a superhero, like up until that time, it was the best Superman fight that wasn't Superman. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It was like, yeah, it's like, oh man, if this was a Superman movie, oh, you know, <laughs> yeah. You have to see a good Superman movie since then, though. Sorry, not a not a fan of what's been happening with that character. <laughs> I love Man of Steel. Uh, Superman love was in it. He was in it for that long. <laughs> when he was learning how to fly, and and that joy of him learning how to fly, and it was he was that 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 monologue and the music. You know, he he was there for a second, and I was like, oh, got a glimpse. You got this gloomy, like angry, dark dude back again. <laughs> Anyway, we ain't gonna fight about it. Let's change. Let's change subject. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I just put, I, have my, uh, I have my opinions about that too. But you know, <laughs> as far as like why the MCU has been, you know, kind of stumbling around, you know, mm-hmm. so, not the MCU, but the DCU. Sorry, but DCU. Yeah. Uh, well, I just put John's link there. Uh, but we've been getting a lot of comments. I'm putting his link in there again, where you guys can go purchase the book. Apparently, there's only two more copies left online. Man, uh, so why don't you go? Man, I'm gonna put my kid through college. <laughs> So why don't you guys go ahead and buy those real quick? I know, right? Um, and, and so he can get some more from his publisher, right? But uh, John, I hope you uh, like the picture, man. Uh, this is the final no, one. No, no, yeah, it looks great, man. Thank you. You know, I'm like, uh, that's really, that's really nice. I should work right. on something. I've been meaning to reach out to you about some stuff too, by the way. Just you know, just in general. But uh, oh, I'm I'm here, man. I'm always here. <clears throat> yeah, I think you're the first. I'm trying to say you might actually be the first artist to draw uh, Frank besides me. Now I think about it. I don't Here, be... live on the show. That's right. Dope. Now that's really, really good. That's a great, really wonderful format for a show too. This is awesome. You know. And then of course, like when you start geeking out about stuff, he <laughs> <it gets, laughs> just burn up time. <laughs> I know we've just been going, man. The the, the conversation has been great. Good. Um, you want to know? Let everybody know where they can find you on social media and stuff. Yeah, I'm um I'm easy to find. I'm at um 
J.I. Jennings on Twitter, right? Uh, John Jennings Art on Instagram. And um, also really difficult, I mean, really hard, excuse me. <laughs> really easy to find it everywhere else too because I work, I work for California. So it's like, you know, if you just go John Jennings, like UCR, then you'll find me, you know? I'm hard. I'm, I'm. I'm. I'm actually pretty easy to find. But yeah. So social media is. Uh, oh, good to meet you too. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. But yeah, social media is John Jennings Art on Instagram and J I Jennings on Twitter. Yeah. Those are like, awesome. I'm always <clears throat> in there somewhere. So. Thank you, Steve Stone, man. I appreciate it. Uh, one of the reasons I do this show is to practice my craft so I can get better art myself. So I, I appreciate that very much. So. All right. Uh, if you're new to the show, thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate you. Uh, we'll be back on two, on Monday with another brand new episode. I want to say thank you so much to John Jennings for making the time to come out and hang out with us and allow me to play in his world uh, with his character. If you did like the show, I suggest you subscribe or follow me. And right up here are all of my social media. Most mm -hmm. Epic Art on Instagram, Twitter, Patreon, TikTok, Facebook, and Twitch. Uh, and if you're watching on YouTube, give me a like, give me a comment. Even if you dislike it, just tell me why. I am perfectly fine. You can't hurt my feelings. I'm trying to get the best possible show I can. And, mm -hmm. you know, subscribers help. So thank you for tuning in. I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, next week, I'll be back with two brand new episodes, actually three episodes. I believe I got Greg coming on next week. And uh, I got to look at the schedule. But it, it, it's, it's an all-star month, all-star month. Um, thank you. Thank you. See you guys later. Oh, this is a real good episode, everybody. You guys are so sweet. I know that's okay. <laughs> All right, guys. Good night and catch you next time.